and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at MediSafe. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Stay on for expert mixologist Natasha, who will be shaking things up with a refreshing cocktail demonstration. And with that, I will throw it over with our moderator who joins us from Healthcare IT Today, John Lynn. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this exciting discussion around digital engagement and involving the patient. We have a great set of panelists that are joining us today, so I invite them all to join us on video for this discussion. You know, obviously, for a long time, we've been moving to digital health and digital health tools to be able to engage patients. And no doubt COVID-19 blew all of that up and accelerated so many of those programs. So we're excited to welcome this panel today. We'll invite uh, each of the panelists to, to join us on camera uh, so we can have this discussion. Uh, again, if you're watching live and you have any questions, there is a Q&A function. Be sure to submit those. Uh, we'd love to incorporate as many of your questions as possible. So let's uh, go around the room. Uh, you know, they already introduced me. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. Excited to be moderating the discussion. And uh, as true gentlemen, we'll go ladies first. So uh, Dr. Grace Cordovano, will you introduce yourself? Thanks so much, John. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Grace Cordovano. I'm a board certified patient advocate specializing in the oncology space. My day to day is working with patients and their loved ones from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end of life care planning. My sole purpose is to help people and patients connect to the information, tools, and technology that they need in order to make educated, informed, empowered decisions about their care. Really excited to have the opportunity to share in this discussion with you all today. Thanks, Grace. Excited to have you here. Excited to have a patient voice involved in this. Uh, next up, uh, Ofer, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Ofer Wax. I do digital strategy and innovation as part of Pfizer's Digital Innovation Lab. Very happy to be here with everyone. In my background, I've got, I'm a pharmacist by training, and I've worked in many areas in the industry, whether that's marketing, corporate strategy, corporate development, and digital health assessments for the last 10 plus years. Happy to see everyone and happy to be part of this discussion. Yeah, glad you could join us. And last but not least, Omri Shore, will you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, John, and uh, thank you uh, very much, HMPH, for having this conversation today and my uh, colleagues here. Uh, my name is Omri. I'm the co-founder and CEO at MediSafe. Uh, our story at MediSafe starts um, about eight years ago uh, when my father, who's diabetic and hypertensive, accidentally overdosed on his medications. And to our analysis, this was a patient journey and patient support malfunction. So uh, we uh, decided to embark on a journey to solve that for um, my father and many others like him. Uh, we have today 7 million registered users uh, on our platform. And uh, we're not focused specifically on diabetes, but we really holistically run the patient. And uh, we work with some of the biggest uh, names in the pharma industry to support for their patient journey and patient support uh, needs. Um, so um, very excited for uh, this conversation today and looking forward to, uh, uh, to sharing and learning. That's great. I mean, let's start right there, Omri. Uh, it's great that you have a personal story. I think almost all of us in healthcare do, since we, we all, that's why we're here, I think, many times. Uh, and, you know, that's the vision we have. But we've seen this major growth in digital health tools and, and really more connected a healthcare ecosystem. Uh, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, there's challenges as well. But how do you see this technology transforming patient support? Um, really want sure. To so if I'm taking a, you know, three to five years view there, uh, I, I personally believe that every pharma uh, product, not only every pharma, every product will have a companion solution uh, with that product and pharma by all means, it, it, because there are a lot of capabilities that are not available today that would become available the moment that you digitize. So today, if you think about patient support, typically uh, you're thinking about a, a hub or an internal hub 
uh, PSLs or nurses that are picking up the phone and calling on patients to give them support. And we still think that there is a major uh, part uh, for uh, in the ecosystem for the human component. That being said, uh, you're, when you have that PSL and they can see what's happening with the patient in real time, the service will not be personalized. It would also not be um, integrated through the entire patient journey. And if you think about the patient journey, typically that would happen on the patient setting. So that really uh, you need to be able to connect the patient setting into the healthcare setting. Uh, so I truly think that the future is really having a personalized experience an integrated experience where there is a flawless integration between the digital side and the human side and data can be, can be exchanged in uh, near real time to prove the value and the impact of solutions. Grace, what would you add from the patient perspective? Uh, does this view and this look into the future excite you or concern you? What, what do you see? Well, I think I want to start by clarifying a few points. So let's talk about patient support. Let's hone in on the word patient. And I'd like to just modify that and say, let's look through the lens of a person living with a diagnosis or diagnoses. So in a clinical point of care setting, um, they are patients perhaps, but once they walk out that door, uh, they're trying to live their best life with their diagnosis and diagnoses. So why are we seeing the growth of these digital tools? Because life is complicated. Life in a pandemic is more complicated. Life in a pandemic with one diagnosis is complicated, more so, and then throw in a number of diagnoses on top of that, multiple comorbidities, cancer, perhaps you're trying to take care of a medically complex child as well as aging parents. What a mess. Okay. And people are still homeschooling and we're dealing with a pandemic. So we need tools. Life needs to become, we're talking about support, but we really want to allow people to live their best life. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about support, it's not just hand holding, it's helping people accomplish the work that they need to do to get the care that their board certified physician or physicians and care team have prescribed. We often don't appreciate unless we've walked in those shoes, how tough and how much administrative burden and how many um, hoops you have to jump through in order to get the care that you need. So technology is helping to automate what has traditionally been a very fragmented, manual, paper-based, fax machine-based process to really modernize not just the patient journey, but allowing you to be a mom, to be a parent, to be a spouse, to be a grandparent with your diagnoses. And I think that's really the lens that I like to appreciate it from. Yeah. I mean, you bring up the fax machine, but the phone call as well, which I think it's interesting balancing all of those because some people may prefer a phone call. Uh, offer, uh, what would you add to this discussion as far as how you see technology transforming patient support? I think Omri and Grace captured it well. I would just add that uh, the patient journey of the future is not the patient journey of today or even a year ago. A patient now has the ability with these new digital tools to get data, access to data that, that they didn't have before. So the holistic way of getting information, whether it's from a wearable or from a smartphone or even from a tablet or anything along those lines, empowers the patient and creates the support system that they might have not had before. A patient with a diagnosis can easily connect their information to a caregiver, which is something that in the past wasn't an option. And right now it just creates that much more of an ecosystem for support, whether that's from understanding where they will get the next uh, product or how they can actually send the information to the physician to flag a potential risk. So for me, it's a lot of uh, ways of risk mitigation and being able to make informed decisions in a support system. Yeah. We have a great comment from the audience that said, amen, Grace, we aren't patients. We are humans with medical needs. Uh, I think that captured the message pretty well. I think the challenge, and I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, offer on this, uh, is, um, you know, what elements are really essential to drive the patient engagement and support? Because you have people like Grace and the people she advocates for that are very engaged. And I'll use me on the other end. I don't care. <laughs> you know, like to some extent, right? You know, I care, but not enough to actually do something. So what are the elements that are really needed to drive that type of patient engagement? Yeah, no, that's a key point nowadays. I mean, 
in many ways nowadays it's meeting the patient where they are. It's understanding that patients aren't, to what Grace was saying, patients aren't a clump of uh, people. A patient is a person. And having as much as a personalized experience as possible, whether that's from the CX component, whether that's from understanding a specific disease area, for example, in Pfizer, we have a lot of rare diseases. We want to make sure that the patient understand that they have the right information at the right time to really give them value. So the way that the elements really to create a successful ecosystem and to create a successful digital health tool is really to understand the patient journey, understand their needs, and give a solution that's valuable to that exact point. Amri, what would you add to driving that patient engagement and support? Right, so uh, the way that I would think about it is that I would follow the journey from the moment that one gets diagnosed through prescription, through the whole therapy journey, and understand that not one size fits all. And, but in order for you to design for not uh, one size fits all, you really need a really big menu of all sorts of different solutions. And you need to be uh, very thoughtful at which intervention, as we call it, uh, do you present to each and every patient at what point in time um, so it fits the, uh, you know, grace type of uh, A-type patient, and it would also um, uh, fit the less engaged patient. So, um, you know, and even the less engaged patient needs some level of support, right? Where, how do I order? How do I get my next dose? Uh, what do I need to tell my doctor? So there, there is, you know, maybe more of the basic layer that is required for everyone, and then a more comprehensive for the more engaged patient. And how do you develop that engagement through time? Yeah, and Amri, I'll, I'll throw in, uh, Matthew uh, has added a kind of a comment and question around how do you differentiate between say, well care versus chronic care? And how do you, how do you, you know, customize and personalize that engagement because that seems like a very different experience i've i've almost described them as two populations that have very different goals and aspirations what are some ideas to engage those different populations so i'll i'll touch specifically on that so uh matthew is uh kind of uh differentiating between two types of patients that's, I think that is not the right way to think about it. So I'll challenge our thinking about it. Sure. I'll say that there are so many flavors that each and every um, uh, customer is, uh, as Matthew um, speaks about it, right? Each of them has their own uh, perspective, have their own condition, uh, life, and so on and so forth. So we can't really think about differentiating between you know, between the well care and the chronic, we need to think about each and every individual separately. Yeah. And so the, the, I'm challenging the, the old patient persona thinking that, you know, the, the, the exercise that people used to do is kind of hang on the walls, pictures and do patient personas. This is a one size fits all in four flavors. Um, we need to think about really a personalized approach and technology allows us to do that with we couldn't do you know it was very challenging four or five years ago now it is technology that is available readily available uh to deploy so i i want us to think about multi-persona and not just you know four personas that you imagine the product for if it makes sense for us yeah, it sounds like you're you're suggesting that if there's 5,000 patients, there's 5,000 personas. Just because you're a chronic patient, you might be in denial and not engaged, right? Uh, you know, I, 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 yeah, we did an interesting survey recently uh, with patients who had two or more chronic conditions, and we asked them why they weren't doing this chronic care management program. And many of them said, well, I'm not a chronic patient. <laughs> and we knew they had two or more chronic conditions. So uh, to your point, uh, it's very customizable. Grace, anything you'd add to this and how to drive engagement? Oh, so many things to add. So I, from doing, from being an advocate over 20 years and also being the primary care partner to two disabled adults, as well as a patient myself, um, I like to summarize not as the patient experience, but the patient or really life experience continuum, where there's five categories. 
You could be a proactive wellness seeker, someone healthy. You could, your second category, be someone that has an acute instance encounter with healthcare that results. Then you cross a line like a, like a prime meridian into chronic illness, where now you're living with this diagnosis or multiple comorbidities. Then you have a fourth category, a life altering, life limiting diagnosis, cancer, ALS. And your fifth category, which we don't talk about enough is end of life care and active death care, which we don't do enough to preserve dignity. These people still have a right to live their best life even uh, in supporting their dignity as they as they leave this life. So uh, when we talk about these things, so you have these five categories, we always look at it from a clinical perspective on a particular diagnosis or two. Um, social determinants of health also play an, a, an, a huge role and have a huge impact on the success. You could want to be a proactive wellness seeker, but if you live in an unsafe neighborhood with no access to healthcare, no access to transportation, in the middle of a food desert, that barrier is so high that even if all of your might and strength goes and dedication, it's just not an achievable goal. And we can, I'm confident by looking at the clinical, where people are in these five categories and their social determinants of health impact can meet them where they are. I want to touch on that we're making a mistake here and just focusing on patients. You could be a, this non-engaged patient, but you could have a heat-seeking missile for information as a care partner, your spouse, your loved one, your child, your parents. And depending where a person is in those five categories, the roles that these care partners play really transform where people really would do anything um, to, to carry their loved one and absorb all the burden and find all the information. So you, I work with plenty of populations and individuals who have limited English proficiency, immigrant populations who are just devastated by their diagnosis and they just cannot engage at the moment, but they are fully trusting of their care partner to take on that role. And we don't acknowledge that care partner and the role that they play. So I want to be mindful in this conversation. Don't forget that the patient and the care partner are, have to be a priority together as a team. Offer, what would you yeah. add to do that? I mean, and, and Omri, I, I, it sounds like you're interested as well. Uh, you know, and, and I think some of the audience is raising health literacy as another example of what you're talking about, Grace, and the challenge that we have in engaging them. Uh, Omri, go ahead. I, I know I cut you off. Yeah, I just had one point to make, uh, Grace. Each and every one of these five buckets, when you start mapping them across the patient journey, it, the, the, the way that the the, the uh, therapy will meet them, right? Could be at different places across the patient journey. So now if, you, if you're mapping the patient journey to let's say, you know, six stops, right? From diagnosis to therapy to potentially, you know, how do I cross the chasm of injecting a drug for the first time? And, and from there, how do I uh, get um, enough literacy and enough understanding about my condition? So all of these, you know, six stops that you'll have, you need to map them against the different personas and the solution is gonna be meet the, all five personas at different points in time. So already you have kind of, you know, 30 touch points to think about. So one of the uh, questions that uh, were, were uh, thrown by the audience, actually to me, so I'll, I'll respond to that quickly. How can technology enable that? So, uh, when we have enough data, so it all starts with collecting a lot of data about patients uh, and and how they how they behave over time, we can start creating lookalike patients. So the moment that John is going to use start using Medisafe, we have John's profile. We will match him automatically and be identified lead, but uh, we will match him against previous Johns, and then we will make a prediction of what do we need to tell John at any point in time to get him to be most engaged. And then uh, we'll try with three different interventions. And from that point in time, the, the platform automatically starts to A-B test the, the, the interventions and understand who really John is and what does he respond best to. And then the next John that comes, we will compare him to this, 
to the data that we already have and we will align. So no longer that thinking about patient personas and, uh, and journey, you, you're building it into a system that can figure out what does each and every patient need to see at any point in time to be most engaged. You need to set it up at the beginning. So that's where the five buckets really come into place. Uh, but the moment that you've set it up, you can unleash technology and let the technology do what it's supposed to, uh, to do. Thanks. Ofer and then Grace? Yeah, to, to, to your point, Omri, data collection is key. The ability to collect this data and to your point of creating a virtual John, a digital twin, if you would, of um, something that would be relevant to not only collect the data in real time, but also to extrapolate what the needs of these patients will be, will be critical. And, and when you think about an ecosystem, to the point we said earlier, personalization is super important. Not every disease area will have these five stages. Chronic patients in certain disease areas will have very different needs of chronic disease areas and more terminal kind of indications. So when we build a solution or when we think of an ecosystem of solutions, we would need to cater this not only for the patient, but also for the disease areas. Digital tools and digital companies that will be rising to the forefront would not only be the ones that have good clinical evidence on how they are valuable for the patients, but also be able to cater a wide variety of specific needs for specific disease areas that would show value to patients. I think that's a great description of how to approach it, but it's so much easier to say on a webinar than I actually do, I think. I think that's the challenge. Grace, uh, what were you going to add? I have some comments. A lot of the digital health tools that we have assume health, wellness, and prevention. And that immediately is excluding a huge population of individuals who will never be well, who will never be healthy, who will never not have their disability or their rare disease. And that's not to say that they don't deserve access to the same types of technology and tools. So even in the language and the vernacular that we use in describing our tools and technologies, stigmatizes and excludes. So I wanna comment about I am all for digitizing and using algorithms and trying to sift through the data to really pinpoint and hone. But let's not forget that there are conversations that we can have. In most healthcare encounters, patients don't even have a goal of care discussed with their doctor and care team. It's blank in the EHR. Look up your own health records. See what it says under goals. It's often blank. What are we actually aiming for? Collaboration, again, including the care partner. I'll give you an example right now at the pandemic. How many of our loved ones, colleagues and friends, perhaps ourselves, are going to a hospital, to a specialty clinic, to a physician, and COVID-19 no visitor policies are preventing anyone else from entering the building? Those individuals are not conference called in. I'm one of them and I'm fighting the system myself with loved ones who are very sick and friends and family that are very sick, advanced forms of cancer, debilitating diseases, recovery from surgery, complications from surgery, and I cannot get in and I'm fully vaccinated. So um, we're introducing um, screening procedures for the pandemic and starting to exclude all the loved ones that play such a critical role. So I don't care how much data you have. We have to be mindful of the, these barriers that are in the way of us being successful with the technologies and tools that we have. We have to have connection. So um, in any of these cases, whether it's a new tool or technology or strategy, these people that we're trying to help also have to be connected to others like them, not just our data and our remote patient monitoring, but peer health support. The reality is that no doctor and care team is quite capable or has the time and capacity to support each patient, but we treat each person that's diagnosed with something as if they're the first one on the planet to walk with that diagnosis. There are welcoming support groups and teams, whether they're on Twitter, whether they're locally at your house of worship. So I think that we need to really close that gap and 
any apps and tools and technologies should have access to a peer health support group because at two o'clock in the morning when it's still that's when the quiet when when those questions come up and you want to turn to someone and you need answers so i think closing that loop where it's the care team it's the it's pharma it's the tools and technology it's access to information public health resources but also other patients who can help the new patients hack a way through the barriers in care, whether they're a public support issue or there's something clinical. Well, put. go ahead, Amri. I was just endorsing Grace for her uh, lovely answer. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's such an interesting challenge. And, you know, one of the attendees offered this uh, comment around engagement, and we're talking about engagement, and suggested that we're putting the responsibility of engaging 100% on the patient. And how do we start to think differently about that? How do we start focusing instead first on motivating people to spend their precious time and effort with a digital health solution for a disease that they don't want to have? You know, how do you, you know, manage that, right? I think that's the challenge of engagement is, uh, you know, they're often a chronic patient. Maybe they don't want to deal with it. To Grace's point, uh, they have a, a condition and they're, they're not really healthy. Um, what are some things you found to be able to help, you know, simplify it for patients or to take the responsibility and put it on, on the healthcare organization or pharma or the vendor? Well, so yeah. although we're also fighting some uh, predisposed stigmas about any sort of information that would come from the pharma industry or from hospitals. Patients, unfortunately, have had bad experiences in the past of getting uh, choppy information or getting information that um, might not have been tailored to their needs in the past. So we're already fighting a bit of a battle initially, and we're trying to make sure that you get the right patient, uh, the right information, because the risk of that is patients really not being able to take care of themselves in the optimal way. And that's what we're all trying to do here at the end of the day. And is the key there clinical validation? Like let's talk about that. And the, what's the role of clinical validation in being able to have patients trust it? Yeah. So if you, if you go even to an Apple store right now and you look at digital tools, thousands, if not tens of thousands of tools out there and a patient without getting guidance from either their physician or from their payer, um, they could get lost. They would need someone to guide them on which tool can really give me value. I mean, right now, unfortunately, a lot of digital tools are competing with other apps. <laughs> Attention is at a premium. And um, we would want the patients to have the best, most valuable data uh, to them. So clinical validation is a way to separate from other um, other digital tools out there. At the end of the day, you would want a physician to believe in a data source that would give this patient the most value. You would want a medical center to understand how, what are the KPIs, what are the things that the, the tool can really, really kind of suggest to the patient that would make their experience better, that would make their health that much better than what they are in their current state. So I see clinical validation, this is my opinion, as a kind of a way to separate between a lot of different tools out there and a way to show physicians what the value is of certain tools for their patients' well-being. Thanks, Alfred. Great. Can I jump in? You know, I, I agree with clinical validation. It's overwhelming trying to figure out what's the right solution for me, but I would like to see more PROs and patient feedback in here. What are people saying? What are, you know, uh, there's the, you know, your traditional star rating. Um, is there a patient rating from patient communities and, and their success? Because there are tools and technologies out there that patients have used and they said, mm, I'm not interested in this at all. Um, I would give it maybe one star. So I think it, the bottom line is if we're not including patients and their loved ones in the design development, ideation, launch, post launch, and all of the different uh, updates of our tools and technology, um, and we don't have patients and their care partners represented on the leadership boards and strategic discussions before we develop these tools. Um, those are things that we can do proactively before we have something that we launch that isn't working well and engaging to people. And actually on the comment of 
tailoring to needs and people not being engaged. You know, it's interesting. A lot of the tools that we have are to change the behavior of the patient. So just think about that. That feels kind of crummy. I'm obviously misbehaving. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But a lot of the struggles that people face are not the patient's fault. It's actually because of issues with the ecosystem. How do patients hold the ecosystem accountable? Where do you report that? So it's an interesting perspective. Um, my doctor may say to a pay or, you know, um, maybe I have high blood pressure and, and I'm following X, Y, and Z, but um, as a working mom, I don't have access to takeout that is low sodium. So I keep going to make choices that I think are healthy, but there's no nutrition label and it's landing me in the emergency room. Simple things like that. Again, looking through the lens of life with a diagnosis, how would you really know that if you're not collecting and listening to why people aren't engaging? So this person keeps coming back with high blood pressure um, that where they're being labeled as a non-compliant, engaged patient, but we haven't really listened to their life story and what that unmet need is. We might not be able to solve the whole thing, but if we can incrementally reduce the barriers and improve incrementally, I think that could be a powerful goal and something more attainable to achieve. Amri? Yeah. If I'm going to touch, if I'm going to touch on validation, I think that in general, uh, you want to look at four areas of validation. So clinical validation is um, super important and is kind of, let's say, table stakes. The layer on top of that is when you already have patients, you want the real world evidence to see that it works at scale. Then uh, there are actually two flavors of real world evidence. One is to compare patients to a a virtual peer group. So you create a randomized trial somewhat, um, but, but in the real world. And you need much more patients than just a clinical trial because uh, you need to give this uh, enough power. You can also look at patients pre and post intervention uh, in the real world. And then the last one that you, uh, that you want to look at is kind of comparative studies that compare different solutions uh, to see how they work. I think that the, the validation in general is relevant for the ecosystem even more than the patient. The patient typically will go for what is recommended by, uh, by it, uh, ACP or sometimes the pharma company. Uh, and, uh, and then they will go to the mostly uh, to the app store, see star rating, see that other people are using the solution Maybe they'll go to a peer group or, or, uh, or um, you know, learn from the internet and then they would just dive into the solution. From this point, it's all about the answering the needs of the patient, right? So as long as you can serve them with the tools that they need at every step of their journey, they will continue to be engaged. But, How do you uh, balance that, Omri? But, like the clinical validation with what where we started this discussion, which is we need to personalize the care for each individual patient. I mean, those feel very, you know, I, I mean, real world data gets us halfway there. And I'll just also throw in Sabrina from the audience said, since we know that patients need needs change over time, is there a constant assessment of the patient's needs as they change, right? So it's like you have clinical validation, but then needs keep changing. So how do we balance all of those? This is the beauty of technology. Uh, and this is what technology can do for us as opposed to just the uh, human protocols. I think, again, I will, I can't stress more how much, how much uh, healthcare is personal and it's human. So we need the human touch at every step of, step of the journey. That being said, my encounters as a patient, my father's encounters back in the days um, was, you know, quarterly, sometimes monthly and in between there are 30 to 90 to sometimes 364 days of life and how can you be there for the patient when life is happening and not health care um, is really I think how you can influence the behavior and improve health for people at scale yeah I mean, imagine doing this in a paper world. I think that's your point, right? We, we couldn't even have thought about doing this type of personalization. Wilfer, is something you wanted to add? 
Yeah, I just want to second what Maria was saying. I mean, the, the, the ability of technology and the ability of these new digital tools to kind of test a hypothesis quickly and to understand uh, the value of something would go a long way. To the point of earlier of clinical validation, in the way I see it, I mean, you would need to have a significant amount of patients experiencing it. And Grace, to your point earlier, yes, the element of understanding how to use patient feedback in order to make a tool that people will use and to get the PROs out of it goes a long way. That, in my mind, I mean, if you didn't have that as part of the initial kind of thinking around the digital tool, you wouldn't have gone to a critical mass, which would result in some sort of validation, clinical or otherwise. Yeah. So Ulfer, from a pharma perspective, how do you really see this digital health playing a role in this patient support? What are the core areas you're looking at as, you know, key to being successful? Oh, it's a huge area. I mean, it's a, it's a huge win for the patient. So think about even the area of remote monitoring uh, tools for patients that, as Grace was mentioning earlier about social determinants of health, you have patients that have mobility issues and patients with mobility issues have historically had poor outcomes from, uh, from a value perspective, from a clinical outcomes. Insert remote patient monitoring as an example. This can be a huge win for patients to understand the progress of their disease or lack thereof and be able to use this information, use these tools to have better understanding of their disease state and mobilize them or have a way even to use other digital tools to get access of the of uh, of treatments to them through delivery service or through other kind of types of um, tools that are out there. This enhances your scope. This kind of like creates a bigger realm of treatment which wasn't there before. That's, mm -hmm. I think, the biggest benefit that I see out of these new ecosystems and these new digital health tools. Amri, what would you add? Yeah, I second the uh, offer, and it's really about building that ecosystem and putting the right tools um, in the hands of the patient. Um, I think that you want to think about uh, um, the, the difference. What's coming new is A, the ability to scale up processes at the touch of a button. So um, it, just the other day, I had a conversation with one of our pharma partners and he said I can't get it why only 25 to 30 percent of our patients are uh, touching um, our patient support group well it's not easy to get to them uh, and I need to know that they're there and no one's telling me anything about that and you ask yourself why well it's pretty darn expensive so the moment that you have a digital solution, uh, you can scale it up and it drives a lower uh, price point that is affordable. And then the last piece is really uh, the ability to reach, to, to reach data at scales that you have never seen before. So that's another, uh, another huge opportunity. Obviously, you know, GDPR compliant, HIPAA compliant and so on and so forth, but you can learn so much from, uh, from that and inform how the, the current processes are happening. So I think these are some. It, it feels, and maybe this is simplifying it a little too much, it's the difference between someone answering a phone call and someone answering a text message. And those numbers are clear. They don't answer the phone. We don't answer the phone. And we, and we read and answer almost every text. So it's kind of sounding like what you just described right there, playing out in real time with patients. Um, yep. Grace, uh, I see you were looking to add to that. Well, just a comment about the answering the phone. Think about everyone that's working from home right now. Think about as a, just as a, as a parent, if you don't have the private space and you have your entire family, perhaps extent other generations living with you, you have no privacy. If you're an essential worker, you don't have an office, but you're on your feet all day in the public, you don't have privacy to pick up a phone call. So conversations about health, even though they're necessary, perhaps an emergency, um, cannot happen in that setting. So we have to be mindful of that. I want to comment about opportunities for something that we talk about all the time, remote patient monitoring. I'm so frustrated that I don't have access 
to something for my mom or some of the patients that, that I'm working with where I could literally take a pulse and look and say, uh-oh, blood pressure, blood pressure doesn't look good. Uh-oh, this is off. Uh-oh, medication's not where it should be or uh, blood glucose, not where it should be or uh, uh-oh, wait, uh, maybe the water is going back up. Something, something, something needs to be adjusted. Um, I only find out about it when I get a call from the emergency room. So remote patient monitoring, I've been advocating and advocating everyone telling me no one's gonna pay for this. What insurance plan is going to pay for this? So that's a challenge. There's what we want to do and what people are willing to reimburse and pay for. So we're our own worst enemy in, in this paradigm. So we're actually not meeting the, the needs of the patient. We're meeting in the restrictions of the financial framework that we're allowed to work with. So that's important um, to know because if I could, I would like to do remote patient monitoring to, to, to monitor for my loved ones to also help coordinate care. And I, something we haven't mentioned that's going to be very innovative is the ever-growing access to medical records and health information that patients will now have, um, as well as the introduction of APIs in healthcare. That's going to be the biggest patient engagement strategy that we have yet to realize the power of. And I think that's also going to drive innovation because we're going to be now seeing more engagement and people are going to say, huh, I really want to move in this direction. People are going to need to follow. Yeah. And oh. if you want more info on that, you, you know, Grace is too, uh, too shy to share, but you check out Unblock Health, which is her effort to really get access to those records. Sorry, Ofer, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to mention two things to, to Grace's point. Uh, and since John, you kind of posed the question is what is, what is the pharma perspective of this? So two point, to Grace's point, interconnectivity of data, um, will play a huge role in this. And that kind of leads to the second benefit of having all these digital tools and having also HCPs adopt these digital tools is the access to real-world evidence. Until now, to Grace's point, there was very little way for either the medical center or the pharma company to understand the frustration. You had a very limited scope unless you actually went to the patient's home and presented them a paper questionnaire of quality of life, tell me what, what's wrong, now you have that ability to do the click of a button and patients have the opportunity to share their opinion, which would lead at the end of the day for either digital health companies, pharma companies, or medical centers to develop these additional tools that are dealing with the frustrations of the patient. So that is also a key benefit that the new, I'd say, digital health revolution is bringing to the table. It's understanding more volumes of data of what's really the, the problem. Where does the, where does the lack of value lie? Yeah. Amri, anything you'd add? And, you know, I think Grace introduced uh, one of the biggest burdens, which is how do we pay for this, right? <laughs> Who's going to pay for all this data and device monitoring and evaluation of the data? What other barriers do you see, uh, you know, and maybe barriers that you'd love to see fixed that would make your life easier as MediSafe? <laughs> I think that uh, a couple of barriers. First of all, um, from a price point perspective, I think these solutions, when they prove outcomes, they pay for themselves. You actually get a return on the investment, which is something that we don't like to speak about with healthcare, but you know, you get a, a positive RI. You wanna see that patients are healthy and are well-maintained. So uh, I think that um, you want to be able, using the data to track the value and then, uh, and then they pay for themselves. I think that in general, uh, one of the biggest challenges on the pharma end is really with risk taking. In healthcare, we are staying away from risks as much as we can. And, but I think that what the industry, especially on the digital side, need to adopt to is that notion of quick to market, quick validations, and scale up very quickly. Um, there is, um, especially with pharma and payers, you see the death by a thousand pilots. You keep on piloting things and you never put the pedal to the metal. You don't put the KPI that is the moment that we reach that KPI, we're really scaling up. And I think that in, it is time uh, for the industry to take a strong position on digital and to say, okay, we're gonna do this quick validation. We're gonna see that works from a patient perspective, from an outcomes perspective. And then we need to, to you know, to, to cross the chasm and uh, take the, that pledge to deploy that for patients um, 
outside of this small, you know, uh, uh, limited pilot. Yeah. Well, for any other ways, things that we can do to overcome some of these challenges and the barriers that you face and, and get out of the thousand pilots? Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, if you think about it, I agree with Umbri that the industry as a whole, including payers and providers, need to be very clear on what their challenges are. Um, historically, it's been unclear. There's been siloed development of tools between kind of say the three pillars and it's always hard to create tools in silo and then have to do some sort of data integration between them to understand how to make it work. Better communication between all the parties involved will lead to bubbling up of the relevant topics and to kind of a joint effort to move this forward. That's my opinion. Yeah. Grace, let's shift this conversation a little bit. In your view, what does the future of patient support look like? I think that when we look at patient support, we got to think bigger and much more out of the box. Um, I'm not saying that we have to have sleek, sexy AI and machine learning, but focusing on quality of life to complement a therapy. Um, I'll give you oncology as an example. We prescribe um, their gold standard treatments for different cancers. We know they have extreme side effects there's very rarely anything that goes to support that patient with those side effects. It's just assumed that, well, comes with the territory. I think really we are so focused on bringing uh, on the clinical diagnosis and improving that clinical diagnosis. We have inadvertently brought the clinical diagnosis to life and not bringing life back to the life with a diagnosis. So I think that's where we need to look a little bit harder on improving. And I think that's where when we start talking about goals of care and what's the purpose of all this, no matter what therapeutic or disease state, bringing some more empathy in and focusing on that person and how that they can really live their best life. I think that's the next step for us. Great. Omri, um, anything you'd add as far as the future of patient support? What does it look like? Yeah, um, first of all, um, fully agree with Grace um, as, as previously, but really uh, you wanna look to follow the journey of the patient, uh, support with the right tool, complement the therapy. And the question that I'm asking is, how can we accelerate the path to having a real companion to a drug that navigates the patient throughout the journey and, uh, and supports them at every step of the way? So that's, I think that's the goal of how do we get there. Uh, integration, personalization, all of these things are important um, to support the patient throughout the journey. Ofer? Yeah, I think two things are happening and will continue to happen. You see um, pharma and as well as medical centers, as well as payers, learning from tech companies, learning how to do things in a more agile way, learning to do, to pivot quicker, to understand value quicker, to really kind of implement best practices and I think vice versa. A lot of uh, digital health companies are learning more about the industry, learning more about the complexities and understanding how to work better within uh, the industry. So that is something that I think will help build the future of patient support. And then the more the larger tech companies are entering the market as they already started to, I will see it become more focused on really patient personalization as we go along. And I'm, I'm curious to see how things will progress in about two to five years from now. Yeah. Amri, where, you know, how can really a pharma or healthcare leader determine where to invest? I mean, we've talked about a lot of opportunities here, a lot of needs to personalize it, to engage patients, but to do so without being overbearing, et cetera. I mean, we've covered a lot of really interesting points, but how, how do healthcare leaders evaluate that to be able to reach patients and ensure their digital health programs are a success? Right. I would start with determining what's the need. Um, um, what are we trying to solve for? At that point in time, you need to choose a solution that aligns with your patient journey vision and how do you support the patients at every step of their journey. And, you know, Grace touched earlier on um, the point around the side effects. Um, and I think that in many cases, if you understand the journey, you can preempt some of these things. Having a, an open conversation uh, with a patient, say, hey, you can have some side effects. This is not fun. The other alternatives are less fun. 
uh, and having these type of conversations are very important. And then the next step is, uh, is how do I go through um, the three steps of standing a solutions up, bringing it to market, looking and seeing how do I assess that it works and then scaling up as fast as I can. Um, this is, I think, how, uh, how leaders need to, uh, uh, to operate these days. Um, I think that the, the days of trying something small and playing with, uh, with, you know, with some toys and see how it works uh, are over. And now the industry needs to evolve and mature and see how do we scale things up. Feels like that's going to catch up with them, right? I mean, to me, you know, you, you're if you're just playing around and you're not fully invested in, in creating the future, I think that's the problem that I hear you describing, uh, you know, and that I see in organizations. Grace, what would you add as far as what pharma leaders should be thinking about and where to invest? I think we really need to include patients and their care partners on our leadership boards. When I look at any company, this is a huge gap in just the expertise of, of real world experience at the get go at the decision making table, bringing those patient stories, those barriers, the, the hardships, the grief, the loss and all of the different consequences of a diagnosis to those investment discussions and legal compliance discussions, but also in the plan. Um, start thinking about what the care partners on met needs are. Um, there is definitely a market there. Um, we see when we talk about what we're going to pay for, who's going to pay for it. Um, it may make sense for people in the sandwich generation, someone like myself to invest in certain tools because we simply can't do it all and we need the support and there really isn't much out there. So really think creatively about the care partners because people are living longer. They're looking to age in place. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, people want to support their loved ones. How do we help them meet their goals? Yeah, I mean, you talk about patient engagement solutions and that you look at the board, you look at their product team and they don't have a single patient giving input. That, that, that's a sign, uh, which it's, you know, like when we say it in an event like this, we're like, yeah, we would never do that. And then you see it in the wild and you're like, oh, actually it does happen. Ofer, were you going to add something? I was just going to say, we've seen already a very positive movement within pharma companies recently of adding chief digital officers, such as the one that we have at Pfizer. Um, digital is here. It's, um, it's a key area of need, and it's a way to get this input that both Grace and Omri were talking about, of understanding the, the key needs and understanding how to create more value for patients. So I think it's a blessed trend, and I think it's wonderful. And uh, we will likely see more of this as we go along. Yeah. Um, fun Good. fact, if I, if I may, uh, yeah. build on Grace's um, a comment earlier on, on family connectivity. One of my team members uh, is texting me and reminding me. So every morning, um, every or well, once a week, every Tuesday morning, we have an all hands meeting. At the end of that, we look at two reviews by patients. So uh, last week's review was, uh, was actually from a patient and she's uh, starting with absolutely a lifesaver. And she's talking about how her husband has it, had um, two quadruple bypass and stents. And she all, also was involved in a car accident. So between the two of them, they take 26 pills a day, 26 wow. pills a day. And, uh, and they're young, they're in their uh, mid forties. But sometimes we forget, and when we forget, um, uh, this app texts our daughter that we haven't taken our medications, and then our daughter uh, feels great because she took care of us. So that ability to, to create that connectivity, not only between the patient and healthcare, but between the patient and their loved ones is super important. I'll touch on one more comment. So we have a, um, a, another pharma partner that we spoke with. Uh, I spoke with them just last week and they're doing a patient journey mapping. I said, how are you doing that? Well, we took a consulting firm. Oh, great. And what are they doing? They're interviewing uh, some patients and they come up with that. I said, well, we happen to have uh, uh, 1000 of your dear patients using uh, <laughs> Medicaid today. I can probably help you with mapping up. And that's only to, to share 
how this patient journey mapping sometimes happen inside the lab and the ability to reach out to the real world and understanding what really is happening there is super important. Well said. There's an interesting question around, uh, is the transition to value-based care an, accelerated, an accelerator for improved patient-centric care or a byproduct? And you know, to me, this question goes to what's going to accelerate this effort? Is it value-based care? Is it you know, pharma's efforts to try to personalize? What, what do you see really pushing us to this new future? Omri, maybe you could start. Um, I think that we want to think about holistic solution. We want to put the right tools at the patient's hands. I think that's what you really want to think about. Um, you know, if you, if you try and start to design your patient support from the patient side and not from the industry side, I think that you will find a much better uh, future. Great. Well, fair. anything you'd add as far as what pushes forward and then Grace? Yeah, I would say that um, it's an area I think that a lot of pharma companies are looking at and understanding the need and understanding how it pushes us forward. As evidence of that, it's uh, the way that you've seen the rise in pharma companies interacting with digital health companies and creating these partnerships in order to get that kind of data that would support those kind of things. So in a way, it is pushing us forward to create better data points and better understanding of patient needs and as a result of that, better discussions around this topic. Great, Grace. I'm taking some notes here. We can't move forward without trust. Trust, transparency, trust in our data practices. Uh, I think a big problem is when there's a journalist that reports on data practices and patients didn't know about these practices. So being transparent on what you're doing with data that you're collecting, um, prioritizing authentic intentional collaboration with patients and families, looking through the lens of empathy and ensuring that we are mindful of the digital divide, addressing social determinants of health. It's going to take a public-private partnership in order to drive this. So we've seen the success of public-private partnership with COVID-19 vaccination efforts and research. And I think that we can definitely do more. And there's a lot that's transferable from what we learned in this pandemic to ensuring that there's inclusivity and making sure that traditionally marginalized uh, underrepresented communities also have access to these digital tools and technologies so that they also can live their best life where they are. Right. Omri, uh, some final thoughts, uh, you know, as we wrap up this, uh, I think, you know, if you go out of this and think that one size fits all, I think uh, you missed the message. I think, I think it's very clear from this discussion that one size doesn't fit all. We have to personalize, but any final thoughts, Omri, as we wrap up? I think that uh, in general, the future is here. And, uh, and, you know, you asked uh, how pharma and healthcare leaders determine where to invest. I would say when to invest. And, um, and some folks who have prior to the pandemic thought, hey, you know, we have time to consider and we'll move slow. Uh, I think that they're now finding themselves uh, kind of last in the game and the time to accelerate is now. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists. They were a great discussion. Uh, all the questions too. What a great audience. And thank you, Medise, for uh, hosting us and for the health team. So we'll pass it back over to them for the mixologists. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to John and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, please welcome Master Mixologist Natasha. Hi there. Hi there. I'm Natasha Soto Algors. Rich Strayer. And together we are Violet and Vine of New York. Mm. We are a couple, so we've been based together throughout all of quarantine. And as a bartender and a sommelier, um, we thought that doing virtual events would be a wonderful transition for people, give them the opportunity to have elevated cocktails right within their home. Uh, so today we're going to make some great spring cocktails and I'm going to let Rich take over and show you the first cocktail, which is the pollinator. I'm doing the pollinator? Yes. Oh, excellent. Great. So uh, the pollinator is a play on a bee's knees. Um, this is uh, 
really fun cocktail that we like to do during the spring and the summer. Um, two ounces of gin is what you're going to need. So any gin that you have at home will work. Um, we prefer a botanical style gin. We're using farmers in this case. Uh, really great, uh, not local offering, but still a really great uh, small batch botanical gin. Uh, then we'll need some lemon juice, always fresh squeezed. Uh, you can basically just get a whole lemon and a citrus juicer and squeeze that right into your bottle or rather your shaker. But we have pre-squeezed ours uh, this morning. And then the last thing you will need is a lavender and honey syrup. We love lavender. I know sometimes people can worry that maybe it's too floral or perfumey, but if it's used sort of with moderation, it's really great in cocktails. Um, the way we made our lavender honey, we actually made a traditional honey syrup on the stove. Um, you can do equal parts honey and water, or we did it a little bit richer, so a little less water than honey. Um, and then we used baking lavender, which you can find at places like Whole Foods, or if you have spice shop in your neighborhood that's also a fantastic resource you can also order baking lavender online so uh you would make that on a stove top you would add in uh, just a teaspoon of the baking lavender a little goes a long way you let it cool and voila you have a lavender honey syrup for this cocktail yes um you can also use lavender flower honey which is honey that has been pollinated by bees on lavender flowers and then blah 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 <laughs> you get great lavender flavored honey. Yes. Um, but then you can also fortify that, boost it with a little bit of uh, the baking lavender, as we said. So let's make the drink. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Because there's I was going to say <laughs> honey beasy, but then that's not exactly. Um, so this is kind of based on a classic cocktail called the Bee's Knees. Uh, Bee's Knees was a Prohibition era cocktail, and at its heart, a simple Bee's Knees is just gin, honey, lemon so our twist on this is the lavender and it just makes it a little bit unique which is fantastic excuse me let's dump that since i spilled it <laughs> do it one more time so we're doing two ounces so that's of the two gin. ounces of the gin waste not more huh? <laughs> and we're going to do an ounce of fresh lemon juice and then three quarters of an ounce, so almost to the top of your jigger with the lavender honey. And this is a little bit thicker, so it may take a second to come out. Fear not. That's, That's it. it. It's so simple. <laughs> we love three and um, Sometimes you go to a craft con, 20 ingredients. It doesn't always have to be that way. So, uh, simple one. And there's a misconception that things have to be complicated with cocktails to be delicious, and that's not true. This is as simple as it gets and as delicious as it can be. Can you hold it up? Uh, just a note on shaking cocktails, as you saw, Rich did a really nice demonstration for you there. Um, vigorous maybe shaking, a maybe a little overzealous, but vigorous shaking. You want the um, shaker to be so cold that it sort of hurts your hand. That's really what we want to go for if we're shaking properly. It certainly does. Uh, now, for our glassware, we're using a coupe glass. You can use a martini shell. Whatever you prefer. We like coupes for that round shape. They hold it very nicely. It sits very nicely in your hand and also looks really good with a garnish on it. Now I'm straining this through a fine mesh strainer as well. I want to get out all those little ice particles as well as any little particles from the lemon or anything else. And then we're going to garnish. What are we doing? Lemon wheelies? We're going to do a lemon wheel today, which is just kind of a nice, I know we see wedges a lot on cocktails the easy way to go. There's something about a wheel and the shape that just looks a little bit more elevated. Um, so that is what Rich is going to do. He's cut a really in nice half. thick lemon here. It's a bit big, but that's all right. It's going to be dramatic and wonderful. So you want to slice it about a quarter of an inch thick. You want it thick enough that it'll hold itself, but not too thick that it looks a little awkward on the glass. And then at the thickest point, cut it right to the center of the lemon and then you have this beautiful sort of pinwheel effect right there on the edge. 
So the overall effect of this cocktail should be very citrusy, very refreshing, and definitely you should like lemon juice. If you like a sweeter cocktail, you can always switch up the proportions on any of these to kind of up the sweetness component. Um, we're always going for balance as bartenders and when we're coming up with new recipes, we really feel that keeping a drink balanced is what most people like on their palate. So um, not too much sugar, not too much sour, always those proportions are working for us. And what's great about this drink is the honey. That, that's really what this is about because you can make any old lemon drop, but with this, it really is about the flavor of the honey when you're sweetening. 100%. Yes, and also just a quick note about gin. Um, we used Farmers, which is a botanical gin. That just means that you're gonna have more of those botanical flavors coming through, the juniper, um, citrus flavors. If you use something like Hendrix, Hendrix is actually gonna have cucumber and rose and all these very interesting botanicals. You can also go for a dry style gin at any time. One of our favorites is Plymouth. We have it on our bar. Um, another example would be Tanqueray, very classic. Beef eater, anything Beef that says eater. a London dry or American dry style on your. Yes, those are, those are the kind of key differences between those two categories of gin for you. So um, we're also doing a zero proof cocktail today. And I like to call it that because I think mocktail implies maybe a concession of some kind or that we're getting something that isn't quite as inventive. And we really like for our zero proof cocktails to be just as cool as our regular cocktails with spirits in them. So um, we're using something called Seed Lip today. Seed Lip is a non-alcoholic distilled spirit. Do you want to tell them how that works, Rich? Yes. So the same way that you would distill spirit or distill water, um, you're going to take your liquid, which in this case is water, you're going to infuse it, heat it with all of these different botanicals and herbs and, and fruit, or in some cases, vegetables, which is the case in this seedlip uh, garden. Um, and then once it starts to boil, you condense it. You're all, you're the scientists here, actually. I, I, you should probably be taking the lead. But here, uh, when you, you send it through a coil or a condenser, so that coil is cool or chill. And as it hits it, it you know, creates water vapor and you get the flavor of those things, but without alcohol. If you wanted to make it alcoholic, you would just ferment it before you boil it. Exactly. All that wonderful stuff. All of that wonderful stuff. So it's very cool that these are things that are on the market now. They didn't used to exist. This is a relatively new concept to have. And this was something created by a mixologist. So it was meant to go into cocktails. It was designed for this purpose. So um, as Rich said, we're using Seedlip Garden, which is their variety that has a lot of vegetable flavors infused in it. And then this cocktail or zero proof cocktail is also going to incorporate lemon, uh, sorry, lime juice, celery, and we made a tarragon and lime zest simple syrup, which is really fantastic. So in that case, we actually just took tarragon and freshly grated lime zest and kind of put those things into a hot simple syrup and let it soak up all of those amazing flavors. Celery is one of those things, it, it sounds, it is a vegetable, it sounds like a vegetable because it is a vegetable, but it's one of those things that provides incredible color and juiciness to a cocktail, unexpectedly so especially when com combined with lime juice or some kind of citrus, you almost don't get the vegetal quality, which is really nice because you can add it to almost anything and make it something that is completely different for people. Exactly. So um, I'm going to go ahead and build this for you. So we're calling this one starting fresh. Definitely going to have tons of spring green flavors. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do an ounce and a half of my seed lip garden. Just to note, we always build in our shaker without the ice in there. We don't need to start diluting the drink ahead of time. It's going to get diluted when we shake it. Um, I'm going to do three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. Fresh citrus really makes a big difference. We're always saying that to people. Like it maybe is about five minutes of prep, but it's so worth it in the outcome of the drink. I'm going to do half an ounce of celery juice. Um, we fresh squeezed our, or juiced. You don't really squeeze it, you juice it. Yeah. Um, we did our celery ourselves. And you don't need to juice it for this. I just word this up in a food processor and then let it sit over a fine mesh strainer for like 10 minutes. And then the rest of it, I just used a spoon to squeeze out through the strainer. And if that sounds like way too much work, you can sometimes find um, celery juice at your, your local juice bar, or you could just ask them to give you pure celery juice. I'm sure they would comply, and then you can use it in a cocktail. And then we're doing half an ounce of the um, tarragon and lime zest simple syrup. 
So yes, this drink is vegetal, but it's also gonna be pretty citrusy. Um, it's sort of meant to be based on a gimlet, so that's why we leaned into those lime fruits. You can already see how the addition of the ice is lightening up the green color and making it a little more transparent, a little more fun in the glass. And we're gonna shake this. While the class is doing that, I'm going to prep our glass. We have these square ice cubes that we made from a tray. Um, what's nice is that they're a perfect cube, so they'll make a nice straight line in a tall glass like this. Gorgeous. So um, I am going to double strain this again, just because, you know, there could be a little pulp maybe left in any of these things, and it's kind of nice to get a very clean strain. So I go through my mesh strainer. The proportion should be pretty perfect. More ice cubes, but we're gonna do our garnish as a little celery stock, just because it looks really beautiful. I always love, I love having plumage on a drink and that's certainly a, maybe shorten it up just a little bit. <laughs> it's a little dramatic. We'll, we'll, we'll chop it down just a tiny bit. Um, but really, really gorgeous. I'm gonna bring it to the camera just so you can see it a little bit closer. Um, but you have there the starting fresh, and this is, again, terrific zero-proof cocktail. Looks really good for brunch, actually, now that I'm kind of seeing it all composed again. Um, that'd be beautiful for a Sunday brunch. And, of course, any of these zero-proof recipes, you can play around with swapping out maybe something like tequila, and this would be lovely. Or you could do this with gin, and then you have a whole different thing. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the celery with tequila is actually one of my particular Good combo, Thanks. for sure. So again, I'm Natasha Soto Alvarez. I'm Rich Strayer. And we are Violet and Vine of New York. You can find us on Instagram at Violet and Vine of NY. We're always happy to give you cocktail tips and answer questions. Until next time, happy spring. I hope you get out and enjoy the lovely weather we're having on most days. And take care, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.